Many persons, themselves city-bred and city-reared, have fled to the soil and succeeded in winning great happiness. In such cases, they have succeeded only by going through a process of savage disillusionment. But with Didi and Daylight it was different. They had both been born on the soil, and they knew its naked simplicities and raw ways. They were like two persons, after far wandering, who had merely come home again. There was less of the unexpected in their dealings with nature, while theirs was all the delight of reminiscence. What might appear sordid and squalid to the fastidiously reared was to them eminently wholesome and natural. The commerce of nature was to them no unknown and untried trade. They made fewer mistakes. They already knew, and it was a joy to remember what they had forgotten. And another thing they learned was that it was easier for one who has gorged at the flesh-pots to content himself with the meagerness of a crust than for one who has known only the crust. Not that their life was meager. It was that they found keener delights and deeper satisfactions in little things. Daylight, who had played the game in the biggest and most fantastic aspects, found that here, on the slopes of Sonoma Mountain, it was still the same old game. Man had still work to perform, forces to combat, obstacles to overcome. When he experimented, in a small way, of raising a few pigeons for market, he found no less zest in calculating in squabs than formerly when he had calculated in millions. Achievement was no less achievement, while the process of it seemed more rational and received the sanction of his reason. The domestic cat that had gone wild and that preyed on his pigeons, he found by the comparative standards to be of no less paramount menace than a Charles Klinkner in the field of finance, trying to raid him for several millions. The hawks and weasels and coons were so many dowsets, lettons, and guggenhammers that struck at him secretly. The sea of wild vegetation that tossed its surf against the boundaries of all his clearings, and that sometimes crept in and flooded in a single week, was no mean enemy to contend with and subdue. His fat-soiled vegetable garden in the nook of hills that failed of its best was a problem of engrossing importance, and when he had solved it by putting in drain tile, the joy of the achievement was ever with him. He never worked in it and found the soil unpacked and tractable without experiencing the thrill of accomplishment. There was the matter of plumbing. He was enabled to purchase the materials through a lucky sale of a number of his hair bridles. The work he did himself, though more than once, he was forced to call in Deedee to hold tight with a pipe wrench. And in the end, when the bathtub and the stationary tubs were installed and in working order, he could scarcely tear himself away from the contemplation of what his hands had wrought. The first evening, missing him, Deedee Dee sought and found him, lamp in hand, staring with silent glee at the tubs. He rubbed his hand over their smooth wooden lips and laughed aloud, and was as shamefaced as any boy when she caught him thus secretly exulting in his own prowess. It was this adventure in woodworking and plumbing that brought about the building of the little workshop, where he slowly gathered a collection of loved tools. And he, who in the old days, out of his millions, could purchase immediately whatever he might desire, learned the new joy of the possession that followed upon rigid economy and desire long delayed. He waited three months before daring the extravagance of a Yankee screwdriver, and his glee in the marvelous little mechanism was so keen that Dede conceived forthright 
a great idea. For six months she saved her egg money, which was hers by right of allotment, and on his birthday presented him with a turning lathe of wonderful simplicity and multifarious efficiencies. And their mutual delight in the tool, which was his, was only equaled by their delight in Mab's first foal, which was Dede's special private property. It was not until the second summer that Daylight built the huge fireplace that outrivaled Ferguson's across the valley. For all these things took time, and Dede and Daylight were not in a hurry. Theirs was not the mistake of the average city dweller who flees in ultra-modern innocence to the soil. They did not essay too much, neither did they have a mortgage to clear, nor did they desire wealth. They wanted little in the way of food, and they had no rent to pay. So they planned unambiguously, reserving their lives for each other and for the compensations of country dwelling from which the average country dweller is barred. From Ferguson's example, too, they profited much. Here was a man who asked for but the plainest fare, who ministered to his own simple needs with his own hands, who worked out as a laborer only when he needed money to buy books and magazines, and who saw to it that the major portion of his waking time was for enjoyment. He loved to loaf long afternoons in the shade with his books, or to be up with the dawn and away over the hills. On occasion, he accompanied Dede Dee Dee and Daylight on deer hunts through the wild canyons and over the rugged steeps of Hood Mountain, though more often Dede Dee and Daylight were out alone. This riding was one of their chief joys. Every wrinkle and crease in the hills they explored, and they came to know every secret spring and hidden dell in the whole surrounding wall of the valley. They learned all the trails and cow paths, but nothing delighted them more than to essay the roughest and most impossible rides, where they were glad to crouch and crawl along the narrowest deer runs, Bob and Mab, struggling and forcing their way along behind. Back from their rides, they brought the seeds and bulbs of wild flowers to plant in favoring nooks on the ranch. Along the foot trail which led down the side of the big canyon to the intake of the water pipe, they established their fernery. It was not a formal affair, and the ferns were left to themselves. Dee Dee and Daylight merely introduced new ones from time to time, changing them from one wild habitat to another. It was the same with the wild lilac, which Daylight had sent to him from Mendocino County. It became part of the wilderness of the ranch, and after being helped for a season, was left to its own devices. They used to gather the seeds of the California poppy and scatter them over their own acres, so that the orange-colored blossoms spangled the fields of mountain hay and prospered in flaming drifts in the fence corners and along the edges of the clearings. Dee Dee, who had a fondness for cattails, established a fringe of them along the meadow stream, where they were left to fight it out with the watercress. And when the latter was threatened with extinction, Daylight developed one of the shaded springs into his watercress garden and declared war upon any invading cattail. On her wedding day, Dee Dee had discovered a long dog-tooth violet by the zigzag trail above the redwood spring, and here she continued to plant more and more. The open hillside above the tiny meadow became a colony of mariposa lilies. This was due mainly to her efforts, while Daylight, who rode with a short-handled axe on his saddle bow, cleared the little manzanita woods on the rocky hill of all its dead and dying and overcrowded weaklings. 
They did not labor at these tasks, nor were they tasks. Merely in passing, they paused from time to time and lent a hand to nature. These flowers and shrubs grew of themselves, and their presence was no violation of the natural environment. The man and woman made no effort to introduce a flower or a shrub that did not of its own right belong. Nor did they protect them from their enemies. The horses and the colts and the cows and the calves ran at pasture among them or over them, and flower or shrub had to take its chance. But the beasts were not noticeably destructive, for they were few in number, and the ranch was large. On the other hand, Daylight could have taken in fully a dozen horses to pasture, which would have earned him a dollar and a half per head per month. But this he refused to do, because of the devastation such close pasturing would produce. Ferguson came over to celebrate the housewarming that followed the achievement of the great stone fireplace. Daylight had ridden across the valley more than once to confer with him about the undertaking, and he was the only other present at the sacred function of lighting the first fire. By removing a partition, Daylight had thrown two rooms into one, and this was the big living room where Dee Dee's treasures were placed, her books and paintings and photographs, her piano, the crouched Venus, the chafing dish, and all its glittering accessories. Already, in addition to her own wild animal skins, were those of deer and coyote, and one mountain lion, which Daylight had killed. The tanning he had done himself, slowly and laboriously, in frontier fashion. He handed the match to Dee Dee, who struck it and lighted the fire. The crisp manzanita wood crackled as the flames leaped up and assailed the dry bark of the larger logs. Then she leaned in the shelter of her husband's arms, and the three stood and looked in breathless suspense. When Ferguson gave judgment, it was with beaming face an extended hand. "'She draws, by crickety, she draws,' he cried. He shook Daylight's hand ecstatically, and Daylight shook his with equal fervor, and bending, kissed Dee Dee on the lips. They were as exultant over the success of their simple handiwork as any great captain at astonishing victory. In Ferguson's eyes was actually a suspicious moisture, while the woman pressed even more closely against the man whose achievement it was. He caught her up suddenly in his arms and whirled her away to the piano, crying out, Come on, Dee Dee, the Gloria, the Gloria. And while the flames in the fireplace that worked, the triumphant strains of the Twelfth Mass rolled forth. End of Part Two Chapter 25